and welcome back to E-Times live streaming from the floor of Embedded Systems Conference 2011. I'm Brian Fuller, Editorial Director of EE Life, and, thank, and apologies for cutting into that, um, but our next guest, our very, very special guest, Jerry Ellsworth, has just arrived um, hard after her fantastic keynote this morning on uh, Thursday, Cinco de Mayo. Um, Jerry is uh, a self-taught uh, circuit designer, um, and as you'll see on the lower third, what we think is a force of nature, just a, just a complete wow. force of wow. nature. She has That's a hard to live up to, I'm sorry. I don't think so. She has a fantastic presence on YouTube, um, and she's just very uh, engaging, witty, and insightful. Wow. Oh, wow, wow. I'm never going to live up to that, but okay. I'll okay. take notes. Give it a shot. Give All it a right. shot. So you talked a little bit, um, from what I hear, because I could only watch about five minutes, about your evolution as a technologist. Talk about that. So I came from a very small town, and this town had no resources for anyone involved with electronics, period, or computers. We had a Radio Shack, that was about it, and as, as we all know, Radio Shack has nothing for, uh, for someone that's serious about electronics. And uh, I was very interested in hobby electronics after starting to tear things apart. I started tearing apart all my toys, and uh, just because I wanted to know how they worked inside, I didn't want to to think that there was anything magical inside of them at all. Or I wanted, I just wanted to know. Yep. And it was very frustrating for my father because I was taking apart all my toys and of course he was paying a lot of money for them. And eventually he stopped buying me toys and he, um, at his business, he put a box out and wrote, bring your broken electronic gizmos on it. And people would fill this box full of stuff and he would bring it home to me every few weeks and I would tear it all apart. And primarily when I was, and I was like pretty young, like maybe eight or so when I was doing this, I primarily would just strip all the parts out of it, break all the leads off the resistors and like kind of sort them out and it really didn't do anything with it. But eventually I made the leap from uh, taking things apart to changing them and that was a huge, huge thing where I could actually modify a circuit. And it was very simple stuff like um, changing an LED or adding an extra LED or, or listening to it with a crystal uh, earpiece and just listening to the sounds that a calculator makes and uh, went from there. And so what, what, what did your dad do? He was an auto mechanic and uh, so he, was he was a struggling business owner. He, when I was very young, um, when I was one my mom died and then uh, he struggled quite a bit trying to take care of, of, of me and then I got old enough to kind of be a little bit self-sufficient and um, I could uh, be alone a little bit more and just have like my grandmother check in on me and stuff. Yeah. And uh, he started a business, this auto mechanic business. And so later on, as, as I wanted money as a kid, he, he brought me into his gas station to work on cars and pump oh, gas and fantastic. he taught me how to spin oil filters on and off and and clean wrenches just kind of like all the dirty jobs and stuff but I, I learned mechanical things and then uh, so flash flash forward walk me through your schooling did you get an engineering degree any kind of technical degree in between then and now so for schooling I started having a lot of trouble in school in in junior high kids started picking on me a lot because I was nerdy and very sensitive and I could cry very easily and uh, so it became a game for them and it really screwed up my schooling academically and my grades started going down and I became more reclusive and didn't want to deal with people um, so I'd hide in the library and it, it kind of pushed me more into electronics and computers but it really kind of wrecked me mentally and then by the time I got to high school um, I, I was a wreck and kids were still picking on me and then one day I snapped and I clobbered this guy with a book and got suspended. And when I, after I got suspended, I um, came back and the bad kids at school were like, you're not too bad. And then they kind of, I had this new gang to run around with so all the bad kids would let me hang out with them. And they, they kind of looked up to me because I was smart and I could like do things that were mischievous like we would like, the school had TVs in each room, and they were turned on by a 12-volt pulse from the, the coax cable. So I made a little um, 
wall ward adapter that I could go and turn all the TVs on whenever we wanted in one of the open uh, jacks. It was quite oh fun God. pranking the school. And they loved that. And they loved that. And I, I really went off the deep end. We really, uh, breaking windows and like really, the more that I, I uh, acted like a, a bad kid, the more um, like the, the bullies left me alone. And uh, eventually it just kept going and going until um, I was, I pretty much just dropped out of school. I started racing cars and building cars. Um, because that was like the most wild and crazy thing I could think of to do. And then pinball machines. No, pinball was just kind of an uh, uh, entertainment thing at All that right. point. Um, dropped out, did the race cars for quite a while, built race cars, welded them, raced them, made a quite a bit of money for an 18, 19 year old. Did that and then opened a computer store with a friend after I got tired of dealing with all the knuckleheads at um, the racetracks. Yeah, yeah. And Ran the computer store, uh, failed at the computer store, and then uh, managed to pull myself back out and, and eventually had a bunch of computer stores, like five of them. And then, then they failed again in 2000 when the the uh, exactly when the margins of computers went from $400 a computer down to $75 a computer. Ouch! It was hard to make any money at that point. And but I I had a lot of friends that were working with me we'd all kind of been friends and my employees and stuff and I we pretty much wrote it to the ground like there was some money there but um, we tried to pull it out and I couldn't so I took the last bit of money I had and I've been doing hobby electronics the entire way through and I bought some tools I bought um, a seat of ORCAD so I could do some uh, circuit boards and then I bought some FPGA tools um, back when you had to buy FPGA tools yeah. and parts and I started making boards and then uh, I, and, and I did something that was really kind of pretty, pretty crazy and everyone thought I was insane and dumb for doing it. Kind of like, well, every, every step along the way, people are like, race cars, you're insane yeah, yeah, for yeah. wanting to do right, that. Right. Computer stores, what do you know about computer stores? Um, I decided I wanted to get into chip design because I really, really thought that would be cool. And so I, using FPGAs, I made all these simulators of, uh, for video and uh, audio and input output. I made these different boards and I would come to shows like this and I would hit each of the booths and I'd be like, hi, I'm Jerry, I'm a chip designer, <laughs> just like, and, and here's some of the stuff I could do. Yeah. And uh, eventually I started getting a little bit of work and like my first job I got was for like $12 an hour. This person was really taking advantage of me. No kidding. Yeah. And uh, um, I'm really breezing over this because I know yeah, we have a yeah. very short time. But um, eventually in 2003, um, since I had made all these little boards that did video and sound and stuff, and I based a lot of them off of the old Commodore computer, which was my, my first computer. Yeah. I love it. Um, I. Uh, there was some stuff on the web that I had all this Commodore um, IP and a toy company came to me and they wanted to make a toy which was a Commodore 64 and a joystick that had 30 built-in games and so they're like well can you do an ASIC for us and I'm like uh, yeah okay I can do an ASIC sure no problem let's go I had never done an ASIC before at that point and nothing like pressure pressure just jumping in feet first and put a team together um, I did all the RTL, all, all the FPGA emulator boards, all the layout for the final production. Um, <laughs> and we did it all in about six months. And wow. on top of that, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, oh, I didn't know, you know, I'd never done a chip before. I didn't know you couldn't, couldn't spin a chip. It was not like it was huge. It was just a 6502 and the video controller and stuff, but it was accurate to the original Commodore. Um, so we were late on the schedule and they were all mad about that because, I don't know, I probably said I could do it in five and it was actually six. So you have to, when you have to get stuff into production and on the boat from China um, by a certain time or you're not going to make Thanksgiving in the States yeah, and that's right. important. So we did a super hot lot where you push all the wafers through the foundry without doing a test run and then so they shipped them all off to China and they bonded them out and started making these these toys and I got a phone call and they said these things don't work you gotta fix this you're on a plane go over to China and fix it now and uh, 
went over there and I'm like, God, should I go to um, run to Mexico? Or, because right, right. it's like a half a million or a million or what, I'm not sure how much total cost it was. It was a lot that they spent. And uh, uh, so I got over there and we opened it up and they'd relayed out my circuit board that I'd sent over and they cost reduced it. They removed all the decoupling capacitors out to save money because I'd sent them the FPGA developer board which had a nice ground plane in it and very good power supplies and they pulled the capacitors off that and they're like, it still works, so it should work on Oh no. Yeah, capacitors, yeah. you know, two cents a piece are expensive. Then I put my finger on the board and touched it a little bit and it fired up and I saw the ready prompt from the the, the Commodore. Uh, like, yes, all right, it worked. So a big risk there. Yeah. Um, I ended up not getting paid for it in the not end, good. which is tragic. I mean, I was supposed to get a royalty <laughs> off of these. But what happened next was um, a reporter, John Markoff, um, oh, yeah. I met him and he's like, this sounds like an interesting story of how this toy was made. I want to do a, a column about it. I'm like, okay. So I started talking to him and I talked to him on the phone and he's like, you know, I want to fly up and visit you in Portland. I'm like, okay, if you want. So he comes out and he comes out to, I was living in this little tiny town at the time uh, of 900 people called Yamhill. And, uh, Good wine. Yeah, yeah, wine country. And uh, he came out there and he was just like astonished. I was taking him through my home lab, which was yeah. just all ad hoc stuff that I'd pieced together, just test equipment, and I was showing him this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I learned how to do this from a mentor. Someone taught me how to use this tool or how to do this. And, and uh, you know, no, I never went to school. And I have this background in racing. And he's like, oh, man, wow, this is neat. And I still thought it was going to be a column. So I was traveling up in Canada for another contract after that, and uh, the guy next to me had the New York Times, and he looks over, and he's like, hey, <laughs> you're right here, and you're like, hey, let me see that. Like, wow, it's like this big article, with, and, and they had, had someone uh, come out and take my photo, and it's like this nice photo yeah, and yeah, stuff, yeah. And, and... And the rest is history. Yeah, it really jump-started my career at that point. So Some now, weird stuff happened, though. You should. They might, your uh, viewers might be interested in. Um, I didn't have much of a web presence at that time, and people really wanted to get a hold of me because of my the story. So they started calling my father, which <laughs> he was Pissed a little. Him off. Well, or he didn't know what was. Or both. He didn't know what was going on at first. It was people like, you know, I want to, I want to talk to your daughter. Is she single? And just like all these strange questions. And he's like, who are you? What? Don't call me. And and. Uh, I was getting these messages on my home phone, but I was traveling, and it was funny just hearing his his progress yeah, of like right. figuring out what was going on. He's like, apparently there's an article about you, and you did something, and so it was. Kind of, I thought that was kind of funny. So today, you you go around uh, speaking. You have fantastic presence on on YouTube. Is it J the channel's Jerry Ellsworth? Yeah, J E R I E L L S W O R T H. Everything I do online's just my name concatenated. So this force of nature has gone from an eight eight year old tearing apart things and then rebuilding them to um, just an amazing presence, social media presence, engineering presence, mentor, teacher, um, great for kids, and um, we were honored to have her as a as a keynoter, and even more honored to have her here on this live stream program. So thank you for your time. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks. And we are going to take a two minute break and bring in uh, our next guest from HelloSoft. So don't go away. Haha. <laughs> oh, so I didn't know we were pushing that close. Hopefully I didn't run us up. So